money to build my dream home. I'm really confused about which estate company to approach. My friend had a bad experience with a particular estate agency after completing his payment and could not even get his title deed. This is serious. Thank you. My name is Ole. I'm from I'm a investor. I'm a Thank you. You know, I must say you came at a very right time. Really? I was thinking about houses. Great. What can your company offer me? EJ Investments can offer you a lot. We're unique in the market. Okay. We own our properties mm -hmm. and we ensure that they develop with modern technologies. They are affordable and they are strategic locations. We don't just sell pieces of land, but we create settlements. What makes your company different from others? We're different from all real estate companies in the Gambia because what we have to offer is affordability, safety, and security. We ensure that you get a legal contract for when you pay your deposit. And within four weeks of paying your final settlement, we make sure you receive your title date. Four weeks? Four weeks. That's interesting. Yes. Now tell me, what real estate service you need? It's absolutely EJ Investment and Real Estate Agency. A warm welcome to you all, and this is the brunch show here on Kerfatu with me, Joy Mama. I'm not alone in the studio, of course. I have my co presenter, Nima Sata Kamara. You're welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, on my immediate right, I have Mr. Lamin Cham, who is from the Standard newspaper, and he will be taking you through the review of the newspaper and the most trending information during the week. Welcome, Mr. Lamin Cham. Good afternoon, and welcome to the brunch. And then, of course, we have our own bonafide member, Mr. Mustafa Dabo. He will also be taking us through what has been um, the most trending or insightful stories on the Kate Fatu uh, website. You're welcome, Mr. Dabo. Thank you. I'm glad to be part of it. Of course, um, during the show, I will be, um, of course, Mr. Lamin Cham will be taking us through the newspaper review, as I said earlier on. And then we'll have my co presenter, Nimasata Kamara, who will also be taking us on the social, most trending um, information from the social media, be it locally and internationally. So, Mr. Lamin Cham. Um, first, we want to wish our viewers a merry uh, Tabaski, and I hope you are all enjoyed it because I definitely do. And thanks to all those that had invited me to um, share the moment with them. Mr. Lamin Cham, you're welcome on board. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I spent Tabaski in two ways. Actually, for me, it was two days. Um, where I stay in my area, it was celebrated on Tuesday, but in the same community uh, where my parents and my family are, they celebrated on Wednesday. So, Interesting. So you can see uh, I had two exciting days of uh, Tabaski. Not, not what I desire, of course, I would like to see, see <laughs> only a single day. Interesting. But there have not been much publications during the past week, okay. obviously because of the long holiday period. Mm -hmm. Uh, but on Monday and Friday, the papers, some of them, were out. And one of the stories that caught my eye, actually, was um, we hinted it here in the last program, and, and, and it became a front page in, one of, in some of the local papers. And that is the, the visit of the Gambia foreign, Gambian foreign minister to Equatorial Guinea. Is the diaspora media apparently uh, followed it up and you know, suggested that the meeting might just involve some sort of negotiation that Gambia started with uh, uh, Equatorial Guinea mm -hmm. for the possible, um, you know, return of former President Jame. Of course, the same media said, well, the rumor or whatever suggestion might be far-fetched or very, very much off the mark because, uh, I mean, if you look at it, it's for all intents, intents and purposes, Jame probably it's too premature for even for his own good to think of coming to the Gambia. But I don't know. How do you find that story? Uh, Nima and Tava. Yeah, I think there's something that we have discussed here. Yeah. And 
It goes without saying that if we have somebody as wanted as President Jame in a country and we have our foreign minister visiting that country, then uh, what comes to our mind immediately is what is going to happen with regards to his return. So it's it doesn't surprise me particularly that people are thinking in this line. Uh, my concern though is how, how comes the minister has not given a, a statement as to why he visited? Well, that was but, but, but uh, which, also which only said it was the normal bilateral uh, <coughs> consultations between the two countries, just as the minister have been to other West African or African countries. But, 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 but then he's reportedly accompanied by the director general of the state intelligence service. I, I definitely did not write this story because I did not have evidence to suggest what the conclusion that's been reached online. But look at the circumstances around. One, you have borough meeting APRC members and often in closed door meetings, I think four times this year. Two, you have rumored disputes between Barrow and his party and these claims that he may want to set up a political party. Three, even the UN said evidence has been destroyed at NIA, SIS. Evidence that we know implicates Jambe in some of the past crimes. The NIA clinic has been raised down. A, a new one is being built. I went there myself. I've seen holes being plastered mm. and I've seen places being knocked down. That's true. Even UN Human Rights Committee in Geneva said it. And one of the th recommendations that they've made to the Gambia government last month was for them to make sure that they protect evidence at SIS, which is obviously not being protected. Fourth, you've seen Barrow change his tone with regards to the issue of Jambe. Now, embracing some few people who had played an instrumental part in the later, latter days of Jambe. You've seen Sidi Njai being part of Barrow's camp. Right. And the last time when I questioned him that, he said, but Sidi is a Gambian. Of course, everybody knows he's a Gambian. Uh, he can work. I mean, we can't push everyone aside. So for me, the story is plausible. So you are suggesting that it is not entirely way, way off the mark I am that saying that, that Barrow, I am saying that is Barrow's intention. That Barrow, from my own understanding. But but this is far fetched. Uh, I am not saying it's are not you, far fetched. I am so, saying. Are you suggesting that President Barrow might now be thinking of softening his stance uh, with regard to Jammy's fate? Exactly. Jammy is quite unpopular. I, I am not thinking. I am it. saying exactly that. I am saying yes. that he is softening his position on Jammy as opposed to everyone else. Yeah, but I think that may be as a result of the TRRC being ongoing. Because one of the recommendations, if there is a recommendation at the end of uh, their entire process, would be to try them. Maybe. Yeah, but if the TRRC in itself is held with some, some degree of seriousness by the no. Barrow administration, we're talking about evidence let's, let's, that is supposed to be presented let's, before the let's TRRC not, let's not being, from, being destroyed. Uh, the, That's the, what the, we're talking the, the about. Online, the, the diaspora made a suggestion that this delegation might just, you know, have started uh, talking about Jammy's possible return, maybe it's far-fetched or whatever. But you're not suggesting that this could well be the case. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Well, what do you think Barrow will Barrow will go to, will, will ever touch that, because that seems to be a very dangerous... Uh, I think, you know, uh, let's look at what is triggering all this. I think it's fear. If you have a political institution that brings you to power, and is threatening to move away from you, and you are seeking a new political constituency, and that political constituency, aside from UDP, which is potentially half of the Gambian electorates, mm. you would definitely need a political constituency that is outside, so you see which, is, which is going to be a combination of UD, APRC, GDC, and the rest. So you definitely don't get APRC if you don't please Jambe or if you don't saw some compromises, you know, associating with Jambe. And uh, for me, every indication points at this. Because but, uh, the, the, the fact that Barak will definitely not, he will ease into it, even if he were to do it, he will ease into it. I mean, I read, I've wrote, written an analysis between this Barrow and the UDP and, and how I think everyone is, you know, of course, uh, you could you could see even the cabinet reshuffle how it happened. Mm -hmm. I mean, cabinet reshuffle took every major power from the UDP. 
Yes. And even though Baro and UDP are going to be in denial and saying all what not, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've seen this. He took local government from them, mm. which is very important when it comes to grassroots political support. That's where you control the chiefs and the alcalos. Mm. He took foreign affairs from them, which is very important for international But, he, but one could say, give them took, the vice president. He gave them the vice president is a mere shadow of the president. Nothing else. Mm -hmm. That's what I am saying. So, so on he the took contrary, powers from them. On, on, in your that, that shows that mm. he is not actually firing but he has prepared his asana so it, on, the, on, on the contrary what many people believe that he has announced an even more glorified udp government you are saying that in fact there he, is no udp he's distancing government. himself That's, from the udp i mean baro is a smart person but this is this is a guy who is in charge of all the machineries of state every institution in this country reports to him he definitely is not going to mess up with people who can render the government ungovernable mm -hmm. because they've called the councils, they control the councils, they control the National Assembly, they control key political institutions. So you definitely you don't want to take them to head to, on yes. on a war. But, so, but, but you, gradually you can, you you can cut his, their influences uh, gradually. Uh, gradually is entangling himself yeah, from I the UDP influence. Is, he hasn't prepared his mind yet, mm. but he's also afraid that these people can ditch me. And in case they ditch, I have my arsenal prepared. But do you That's think, what I am saying. But don't you think APRC, which obviously has, you know, has has very very little support now yeah, compared but, but to others, can be can be can be uh, can, that is what you are saying. But he can rely on. But what destroys a politician other than fear? Why is Jambe? Why did Jambe kill people? Because he's afraid he's, he's afraid going to lose people. power. Yeah, yeah. So, continue Fear with this. Let, let's rest this topic now. Uh, the diaspora and, of course, some local newspapers suggesting that uh, it may well be the case that uh, Tangara's visits to Malabo, <laughs> reportedly accompanied by the SIS Director General, could well have uh, to do with Jambe's possible return. And you put that in a greater perspective as now, uh, you know, seemingly uh, Barrow now taking a soft line on Jammeh's affairs uh, probably because he wants another constituent different from the UDP in case they ditch him. Yeah. Well let's see whether Barrow will track, track that dangerous thing. Um, <laughs> the other one of course was um, the pardoning of the prisoners. Uh, one of them proved quite controversial uh, the, uh, the, the release of the Norwegian um, but then how do you see how do you see it because that that's quite that, that's just where the news is i mean pardon i think prisoners, by, by all indications i'm customers. not so where i see agrees with me but by all indications i think it's it's blatant because everybody knows everybody at prisons and at justice department mm -hmm. knows why that guy was in jail okay but so but they but, released him and they know why he was in jail it's but, a but, pedophile. But, but why is this case different from the others because it's he was obvious because the guy is a pedophile he's he's known to be not very much mentally stable in that he's abused his own son oh, wow. he has abused a three-year-old child and that's has been his life trend yeah, you don't you don't expect that guy in fact njundu drama was njundu is not normally a very passionate guy but he came out saying this is a guy who belongs to hell child protection alliance He's yes njundu child, child protection yeah. alliance but this is a guy who speaks so much soft language but when this guy was released he said this is a guy who should be, who should have been in hell that tells you yeah i i agree with that i so, but what do we know of the other prisoners, the six others? Are they, are they equally uh, Yeah, dangerous? but the, uh, one is murder, uh, which could happen as a result of some accident or mental issues. Okay. And some others are cannabis, we know. So, nobody should even go to jail because of one joint or something like that. In a progressive society. So, I mean, according to you, the, uh, the Norwegian's case proved controversial because he was known to be an alleged pedophile. And, absolutely. And there's a threat. But then the government came out to say it, they actually handed it over to the Norwegian government. I don't know. Which how, is not how true. Is which that. has confirmed to be false. I, I don't know how different is that from releasing him. Anyway. Yeah, but that has, in fact, been confirmed to be untrue. It's not been handed over to the And Norwegian. then the government came, came out to tell uh, uh, um, uh, Paradise TV that they actually investigating. The Justice Department, the Justice Ministry said they are investigating the circumstances that led to his pardoning. Now that's what, that's the tone now. But I think it's normally a recommendation from prison authorities or some respected panel or somewhere out of Yeah, but it has them. to go through the Justice Ministry as well. But the press release came from them. Exactly. How did this even happen? This is an institution that convicted, that prosecuted this guy. Mm -hmm. So how does the same person who prosecuted an individual, put him behind bars, comes to tell people, yes, I don't okay. know about the crime? Yeah. That's absurd as absurd can get. On the investigation as well. Nima, what's yeah. your take on this? 
I'm enjoying this uh, exchange here between the two of you, and you're giving a very good analysis of the issues that have been raised so far. Uh, my conviction is that this government has proven several times that they are not they're very truthful at uh, certain times. And I think that's what makes this case very special. And also because of the, the opposition behind it. Mm -hmm. We have strong, passionate child uh, activists that are strongly against this move that has been made by uh, the Justice Department. Um, the first release that came out came out from the Attorney General's office. Right. Yeah. And then there was a counter release from the Ministry of uh, Justice yeah, saying... That's, that's the same, more or less the same thing. More or less the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so th that is what makes it very controversial. How can we have two releases that says different things? And it also s raises the question of trust between the governors and the governs. And this is where my concern is particularly. Now, where is Norwegian as we speak? The Norwegian as we speak should be in the Gambia. I mean, because they've now indication that he has left the country and that the Norwegian authorities did not, they, did, they said, they, they, they said those of people who are in diaspora who had actually tried and contacted Norwegian authorities, they had actually no idea of this pardoning. So you can't say you, you, no, you have those handed who said over. They, haven't, they didn't even know about it. Yes. Ah, so, okay. so, so, so that's the... But doesn't that's the handing over means he has left? Uh, no, no, but the handing over should have meant, uh, at mm -hmm. least we assume that yes. if you are handing over a prisoner mm -hmm. to a particular country, they have to be notified. Mm -hmm. Yes, but if they are saying they don't know anything but about if they say it, then they don't that only suggests that. one thing, that's been pardoned. Handing over somebody yeah. uh, to, you know, to authorities from his or her uh, native, and, you know, I'm, I'm from releasing him. I, I mean, it's basically his company, he's been released from our, from, from our prisons, mm -hmm. and whether or not he's been taken back to Norway is... It's a different thing. Yeah, but I think pardoning can be reversed. I mean, uh, since this issue came, if you see the justice ministry say they're now investigating, it shows something has happened within, and so, that uh, probably so, an issue is. But so there wasn't a proper recommendation in his partic in this particular. That is case, what they perhaps. are claiming, but that is what is absurd. We know that is not true. Okay, it cannot we, be true. Okay, so so something absolutely went wrong. Went wrong. In, in I mean, absolu case. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Now, the other one, not quite very powerful. Um, you know, of course, we know about the, con well, not, let's not, con not controversy, but let's say intense debate that was generated when it was President Barrow hinted that uh, um, there will be a bridge over the Barra Banyul <laughs> water stretch. Um, Mama Kande, that is the leader of the opposition, opposition uh, GDC, uh, said in Fonye, that in fact the idea of a bridge between Bara and Banjul is a Jamme project and his claims were illustrated kind of you know with a purported uh, a supposed MOU that was also published online but there is a private citizen one Sirif Balde quite an obscure figure if you like but he came out to say in fact the idea came from him and um, he said it was him who broached the idea to the government of then yeah, yeah, Jame, when actually they were talking about a different project, it was a railway. Mm -hmm. And then he said this idea was hijacked by the Jame government and some people flew in on his, you know, you know I mean, sidestepping him. They flew to Moscow, his partners, um, and wanting this project to go ahead without him. His partners refused and they asked them to come back to him, Balde. He said nothing was heard of it until uh, much later, when he, um, which when he had that, uh, I mean, uh, President President Barrow mentioning that the bridge will be built. So he said he didn't know, he didn't know, he didn't know how the idea came to Barrow himself. But he can claim that he was the first person ever to mention this idea of a bridge. He has this Russian conglomerate who which built that kind of projects all over the all over this region <coughs> in, in Conakry they are everywhere now was he said he, he apparently said mama was looking for cheap cheap popularity yeah, cheap, yeah. I mean he targeted Fony so as to woo or Leo uh, APR he supported his party that's why he came with that project but then how did you see Baldes claim he he obviously came with volumes of papers backing his correspondence actually uh, you know uh, backing it his could claim. be true it could be true uh, but but Barbo may not even but have seen some of those. Barbo may not also have seen so, some documents. He may also have seen them. 
Um, I don't know. It's his word against bottles. I mean, in this kind of situation, <laughs> I don't know what to think. Obviously. <laughs> Not against mama in this case. Well, he yeah, doesn't this know. was he against doesn't, mama. He doesn't, so know. I he doesn't know where I mean, Baro got, 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 yeah. got, got. Mama could make that claim and he could be right because at the end of the day, if it is a. Uh, that was actually an MOU that. Uh, well, I don't know whether it was mama who presented, but it was presented online and that suggests. His claims are credible. But he was <laughs> signing two times. Uh, my whole position on this. But they say that this could be, this this MOU could have come from some people who just fooled them and said, "Well, we can get other investors to do it if this man and his Russians are no longer willing." Yeah, well, but the basic truth is that anybody, uh, you, myself, her, anyone, can actually get investors to do exactly this. So it's not something that so here's, somebody here's has theory. to study well yeah. or so be here's smart. My, you have do. a private citizen who sells an idea to a government. Yeah. The government takes it as their initiative. Yeah. And then they were not able to implement the project. Yeah. Another government comes and take over. So his struggle that's, is yeah, Mama, that, Mama saying that mm. it was Jammes' idea. So the idea of bought, like build, operate, and transfer, mm. happens almost everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It happens in Guinea-Bissau. Yeah. It's in Senegal. Yeah. It's in, so you know, it, it, it's something and, that and, you know. His, uh, his, his suggestion also, I mean, his claims also suggest that the project may not be feasible unless any government, that is this one or Barrow or anybody who comes, provide people with tangible feasibility studies that the huge investment necessary is at hand. Yeah, but but mm. this bridge, can, this actually this waterway can also be tactfully bridged without costing Gambia much money because you would see the, the, the area of Banjul Bara that is too far, too distant, like too long, it's this one, yeah. like the one that is at ports. Yeah. But you can bridge Mandarin, Mandina Ring and this other area, like the river Gambia, yeah. so that people would go this way and cross to Birikama and then come this direction. That, that will be a long If long you don't have so much money, no, you, you can, can do you that. But well, according to him, his you can bridge River his Gambia instead of the, his the seven mile water bridge. That, that's obviously going to allow traffic, uh, container ship traffic. So, well, it, it has, for the, for the coming years, it's Barrow's problem. It's not, <laughs> yeah. not ours. <laughs> obviously. What do you have next for us, Mr. Lamcha? Well, let me, perhaps let me end by saying that the controversial election process of the Gambia football. Uh, federation has come to an end. Uh, uh, Lamin Kababaj was re-elected in courts because if you talk to Malik Silas come they will say who did he contest against yeah. because they said they withdrew from the case but the, elect uh, the, the process but the electoral chairman said since he did not receive a written uh, information from the Silla camp then he will put their names in the ballot that's the two candidates there Silla himself and his third vice president for the danger mm -hmm. but Silla has come back to said well since you did not write to us formally to accepting our nominations. You only made a public announcement that we are qualified. Mm -hmm. Then we too don't feel the need to write to you to say we withdraw. So we are going to make a public announcement to say we withdraw. Wow. But apparently that's all passed now. Even though the Silla camp said they, they, they felt that justice was not seen and they will fight for justice some, some other day. Mm -hmm. But perhaps what is important is that the Gambia is faced with two crucial international matches coming September the 8th and September the 10th that is African Nations qualifiers for the 2019 uh, tournament against Algeria first hmm. and Togo both in Banjul first just just a couple of days okay. apart yeah. so that's the biggest issue now um, how much are we prepared we've got a coach uh, a couple of weeks back who's going to be here for nine months uh, now the big biggest focus is is it an international coach? Oh, or oh yeah, it's from Belgium. Um, now the focus now, the, the election saga has now died down a bit. At least people are united now. Mm -hmm. uh, looking forward to see who, how will Gambia fare against Algeria and Togo um, you know, next month. So that is, that is the latest uh, issue on that. So. Thank you very much, Mr. Lamicham. That was quite an insightful um, story starting from um, the breach case to um, political cases. And I believe yeah. most of us have learned a lot from this. But before much ado, I'd like to um, uh, give the floor to my co-host, Nima Saka, to tell us what has been trending, be it locally or internationally. Nima, what do you have All right, say? so it has been hot on social media. Two uh, important things came on, uh, on top of what has been trending. Uh, we've just discussed the, the pardoning of the Norwegian uh, convicted pedophile uh, raising very hot controversies from the side of the government and also based on what people are saying on social media and the questions that it have raised. Right. Um, 
Yes, the social media. Yeah, the, been the fact that uh, from the same institution within the central government issuing two uh, different press releases that contradict one another. Of course. So guess mistrust between the people and the, gov uh, the government, and this is something that has been trending on social media. Um, another thing that has been trending that has been a hot case on social media also has been the 11 million saga. Right, so GRTS have announced uh, that President Barrow have donated uh, more than $11 million to, the to the pilgrims in Mecca. And when that raised controversies on social media, the press release came from, was it the president's spokesperson? That that was not true, it was the, the government's spokesperson. spokesperson. Yeah, that it is not from President Barrow himself, but it was a donation from an anonymous source. Uh, and the thing anonymous source also raised some concerns that it's something that we are very familiar with mm -hmm. when there are controversies with government spending and people are concerned about where money goes and what misplaced priorities are there. Right. Uh, the justification that comes out is it's not our money, it's not from us, it's from an anonymous source. So this also raises questions of transparency. Can we trust our government? Are they telling us the truth? Who is this anonymous source? What are we losing as a result of other people giving us money that we don't know where they come from? Um, so this, these are the things that are trending on social media. I don't so, know if... So um, based on this that you have said about the 11 million the lasses that were given to the pilgrims, mm -hmm. you know, what have been some of the brow-raising questions that um, the social media uh, community yeah, has been I'm facing? talking about, yeah. yeah. So the first reaction was <laughs> that uh, very recently, we talked about uh, the blood bags being very limited of course. or non-existent at our hospitals. We're talking about deplorable road conditions. We're talking about a dilapidated infrastructure where all of this money could be utilized. Then you have a president uh, claiming on our national television that the money is from him and a donation to individuals, private individuals, on their own private worship. Uh, so that, that raises concern. Concerns about the misplaced priority. What are the priorities that you are, you, you are uh, Mr. Lem, sidestepping? Mr. Levinchab, I see yeah. he's been itching to say something. Yeah, I, I think in fairness we have to put the actual statement from the government in clear perspective, to be fair. According to the government spokesman, the announcement on GRTS was wrong and incomplete. Right. <coughs> uh, Initially, the, it was the GRTS who broke the news that it was Barrow who donated it straight to the pilgrims. This was um, one of their staff who actually is, is there on, on, on I, I understand, on, 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 her, on his private uh, assignment because according to my information, it was not officially GRTS who delegated him or so. Mm -hmm. Now, when this money was, what was being presented by our ambassador, is it ambassador or how do they call it, consular there? Um, he got the impression that this definitely, maybe that was said to him, that this was given to them by the president. Now when the announcement came, uh, the reaction on social media, like you said, so mm -hmm. the things you are talking about, you know, exploded. I wanted to know, oh, now is Barrow another Jammy? Uh, does, he, does he too have a, a World Bank or God, God's Bank that he's donating? Where is the money coming from? Now the government spokesman came out with a statement to say that actually it was not from Barrow, that was wrong. Mm -hmm. It came from an anonymous Saudi Arabian or somebody who don donated these things. And President Barrow felt that, well, since this was actually, um, you know, during the time of the Hajj, mm -hmm. it would be better to distribute it to the pilgrims to help themselves with whatever they, um, uh, their needs are while they were in the holy, in holy place. Mm -hmm. And that, that it did not help actually to quell you know, down the, you know, the, the rumor monger or whatever, the speculations as to where the source is. Because in my view, I think the government should stop this anonymous sourcing and anonymous thing. It doesn't help in uh, ensuring that people trust or people, people believe in your transparency. Yeah. Because when you are dealing with government, especially resources, you don't talk about anonymous, anonymous sources. Obviously. I mean, the simplest thing is, uh, come on, even the Slavin Cham who donated mm -hmm. 57 pickups mm -hmm. to the government or to Barrow, say Lamin Cham donated it. Mm 
That's all. Yeah. And you are out of it. People will say, what is Lavin Jam's motive? Mm -hmm. Is he trying to woo the president for some contract or something? And that's it. Yeah. But as far as the president is concerned, the government, they are out of it because they already told you where are they got it from. Yeah. Yeah. But if the government says anonymous, you are entangling yourself more and more in a, in a, in a vortex of conspiracy theories, you are not freeing yourself. Yeah. I think it's good for the government to now say exactly what happens with donations or grants or whatever and stop using anonymous. It's not helping them. Yeah, and I think one thing that they need to also understand is when they say anonymous, they think that takes them off the hook. It doesn't. No, it just because whatever is being donated <laughs> to the president is not for the president, it's for the country. Mm -hmm. So when they say it's not from us, that doesn't make sense. It is from us because if it's given to us, then it becomes ours. Mm -hmm. um, and also another thing is if somebody is going to donate money and they don't want to be named, you don't want to get involved in that. You want him to donate to the people that he wants to donate. Yeah, it it does, yeah the, the state doesn't have to come into contact with that money, in mm -hmm. fact. But when it happens, also, I don't believe that GRT has wrongly reported this. Because if Barrow... Well, according to the government spokesman. According, yeah, the, the I don't believe they wrongly reported. I think the fact that GRTS has to report uh, this donation in the first it's place... It's confirmed. GRTS doesn't report the rumor from presidency. Right? Yeah, it, I'm saying that the source of the story... Because, of course, in line with GRT's editorial thing, yeah. it might be that they want to please the president or perhaps to uh, blast his How image. do they get access to the information in news? Yeah. But no, the fact of the issue is, the fact of the issue is what the substance of what GRT has reported has not been refuted, that 11 million something something has been handed over. Yes. That's the I, fact I, of the whole thing. I think the, 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 the problem is where it come from. Jia said from Baro. And the government spokesman is not from Baro. And it's from Baro because this, this, this individual... Because now the basic thing is... The anonymous donor. Uh -huh. The anonymous donor. Uh -huh. Where the government spokesman had a problem... Well, let's say the government. Because mm. when you say the spokesman, you mean the government. Where mm. the government had a problem is... It's not directly from Baro. Because that's what prompted the people to ask where did he get the money from. So the government is concerned that perhaps if they have been if they have clarified it's not from him, mm. perhaps people will now fall back and say, "Oh, okay, after all, it's not his money, so we don't we have no right to say where he comes yeah. from." My but then again, when you say it's anonymous, and then you are saying in the context that Barrow couldn't have any money donated to him in his capacity, it must be for the government, and he, you know, he said, "I agree." But what the government's concern was, they wanted to kill this speculation and these criticisms as to where he got the money by now clarifying where the source of the money is. But then, of course, in so doing, they modded the whole affair again by saying it's anonymous, which doesn't ensure... Yeah, yeah which is actually worse than GRTS yeah, did. Yes, that's right. Which, which kind of... Uh, I'm, go I'm going to hand over to Joy problems. to say what she wanted to say. Um, okay, yeah. uh, my humble opinion today is um, I feel um, information have been really distorted in one way or the other. Because Jordan, from where the spokesperson came in and the reporters from the state television also came in was a bit you know frisky should i say because if you look at the genesis of this they were on the spot on the ground to get information and afterwards an interview was being conducted with mr ibrahim asankara mm -hmm. who is the government spokesperson so i will suggest that this government should actually work on their communication with both the reporters, be it state, private, or whosoever, and the public, so that we should, um, they can avoid all this misinformation. Because based on what you have said, this can lead to mistrust and the rest. So my humble opinion is they need to really work on their communication interactions yeah. with both private and um, I think what he, he said others. Mm -hmm. Now that you have a government spokesman, mm -hmm. an office of government spokesman, I think they should coordinate. I think what it means is that all information is coming from government. Mm -hmm. Comes so, through so him come and from the media this, picks up exactly, from there. It should come from the spokesperson. For example, yeah. the, 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 the release about the pardoning of the prisoners came from justice ministry directly. Yeah. Well, yes, they are the competent authorities in dealing with that. But it would have helped mm -hmm. if the government spokesman's office had been used mm -hmm. particularly to come out with a statement. Perhaps, mm -hmm. you know, there would be more direct. Yeah, but, but that, that doesn't, is why that he doesn't came still the other change time. the situation. No, 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 there is only one problem here, and that problem is Barrow taking anonymous decision, anonymous gift. That's, period. That's the problem. 
So the, if, as long as Baro continues to take anonymous donations, yes. the government can spin it. There is no way you can. Yes. That's, he that's, takes that's it, he the, takes that's it. That's, 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 that's my point. That's my that's point, point. So is he, not about misinformation. It's, not it's about yeah. giving an information that you wanted to give in the first place. It causes damages and you come back with another information that, that, that causes creates even more damage. Because she distorts like, everything. Like said, we're yeah, going the, to what next? The thing about anonymous thing is certainly not helping them. Uh, and this is from because the, 40, the 57 pickup thing is still a mystery. Uh, sure. I mean, the speculation doesn't die down. I mean, if you said anonymous, you are entangling yourself rather than freeing yourself. Yeah, from especially it becomes a trend. Yeah, I mean, if you say, you're my camera who gave all the 57. A pickup finish obviously you're out of it people who now wonder what was the motive of nima where was our sponsor from but then you are out of it you have told yeah people what, what are we losing ourselves exactly. on? okay so we're going to move on from that there is another very hot controversy on social media involving the first lady uh the wife of the president obviously former president or this president this president Interesting. Uh, so there was uh, a document that came out, I think, from Giti Bank, correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. uh, published on social media, especially on Facebook, that there have been a transfer of money from, uh, I'm not sure exactly from what source, but to the First Ladies. I think it was a foundation, a money meant for, a fo for her foundation was transferred into her private account overseas. So there was that, 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 that trace of document that is circulating on social media and the person behind this swear on his life that this is true and it raises questions of corruption. Hmm. Yeah, so this is also trending on social media. It is, uh, it is um, going everywhere. Um, there is no confirmation from the government. Yet. There is no, nobody that came from the government or even from the first to justify that this. Uh, this information. So it's still out there and it is a concern that we should so um that. if i'm to ask you let's speak on a lady to lady ground yeah. uh you know with the previous first lady we or most of the public were so concerned of how much she spent on her um accessories mm -hmm. or her um, her closet mm -hmm. what would you think like with this first lady do you think um a lot has is been put to her closet or her accessories that would have warranted such a huge yeah. amount of as, money to be transferred as, as a lady i find that to be sexist because it shouldn't matter as long as the money is legitimate it shouldn't matter how mm -hmm. much what she wears how much right. it costs if it is legitimate okay now the only question uh, should be where the money is coming from if the money is costing us the citizens our taxpayers money then that becomes something that that to raise concerns but as far as her closet is concerned that is her she can do whatever she wants with her mm. own money however expensive her clothes are i find it very sexist that we don't question what men wear but we question what <laughs> women wear <laughs> Uh, Thank you very much. That has been I, an interesting one. Yeah. I'm not quite familiar yet with the story. Although yeah. I, I, I heard it a lot uh, and, and I heard, the, like you said, it's Yeah, I don't think a lot of people picked on this, I, this information. I, but I think yeah. I'm not surprised that uh, I think like this, in the, in, the, in the case of Africa, these first lady hmm. office or first lady charities have always been looked upon with some suspicion by citizens and people mm -hmm. concerned mm -hmm. as to whether it's actually will lead to transparency or whether the office of the first ladies should even be created or etc etc mm -hmm. uh, i remember there are still unconfirmed uh, rumors mm -hmm. uh, speculation that uh, the first lady of uh, uh, former first lady mm -hmm. uh, i just started with tutifal jameo yeah or, and then of course Zena Zena. Zuma, mm -hmm. you know all have probably money is donated to them mm -hmm. that probably when they sound or confirm allegations mm -hmm. so i'm not surprised that we are going to, we, we are having similar uh, you know allegations or speculations as mm -hmm. this one too yeah but i think my advice is since it has now reached this level mm -hmm. in terms of uh, uh, its publicity it's mm -hmm. getting now online mm -hmm. i think it should now attract the attention of the government the media uh, especially uh, well the media the mainstream course, media, the media, the mainstream yeah. media we are on top of it we are mm -hmm. trying to Mm -hmm. uh, get get comments or confirmations or at least comments on this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think now, you know, some, in some cases, government doesn't have to wait for the media mm -hmm. 
you know, when uh, <coughs> wild rumors and very serious rumors like this are growing, before they become monsters, but you, you don't monsters, you don't expect the government to take up no, something no. that is against themselves. Of course, I mean that that would be no, the no, easiest. No, no, is this what? even government or is it Barrow? Well, I mean, it, 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 it is the president. It is the president, but it but can be linked to the president. His, you know, presidency. The it's the president right? and his wife. That's right. What I'm saying now is, before this rumor get, gets monstrous, mm -hmm. that's the time you come, come and clarify. Then people will think that you take this to be serious. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it will not allow it to grow into a bushfire anymore. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, the mainstream thing are, are working on it is trying to see whether, when it is you know, safe and when it is balanced to use it. But of course, you know yeah. what the what the what the online uh, you know media and social media can what they are, what they can do. The mainstream media can't do it can't uh, do that. safely. That, that's true. So, as a final point, I want to ask you this question. I think these and the many other things that we have discussed here is this question of what has changed mm. from the Jame regime to the Baro regime because mm. we're seeing a lot of things repeating themselves. So, what do you think has changed, really? I think what has changed fundamentally mm -hmm. is the awareness of the citizenry mm -hmm. to not go back again yeah. i think that has changed yeah. i mean for anything and you know democracy is actually the power of the people to be in charge of their own country mm -hmm. i mean we've seen it in talk okay. we've seen it in Turkey. Okay. Turkey, a lot of people say Turkey is a dictatorship blah 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 people I'm are biased really when it comes to that yeah. because yeah. i work for them but the thing is you've seen what happened when there was a, a an overthrow. Yeah. It was and civilians who took to the street and, and take the country back from the military yeah. men. Yeah. That's what democracy is. Democracy is the citizens controlling of their own country. I think and that's what you've seen happening. Yeah. They've stopped the they've stopped the, the, the monkey park from being destroyed. They've stopped places from being mined mm -hmm. ruthlessly. They've but stopped a lot issues. of things. Yeah. There are still issues, but the citizens will stand their ground. That's yeah. fun. No, I believe and, that. and I want to add, they, they force the government to come out to justify why they do what they do. Even and I they think they will continue. Process. The people will continue to fight. In the court, Honorable Khalifa Salah, mm. he said people, well, people who disagree with uh, Barrow's, mm. Barrow's style or Barrow's government will mm. come to him and say, mm. look at you, waste your time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, working very hard to ensure this change and look at what is happening now. Mm -hmm. And he would say, no, 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 you people have missed the point. Yeah. You should realize that what has changed, what has enabled you people now to talk, is what has changed. That is what True, has changed. Yeah. And you are focusing on the government and not the And that is the most All important right, so, thing. Yeah, 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 thank, 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 thank you important. very much, that gentlemen. Is the most uh, right. That ends our What's Trending on social media, and I'm going to hand over to Joy to continue with the, the rest of the program. Uh, thank you very much, Nimasata Kamara. That was quite an insightful session with you on what's trending on social media. And, of course, now I'll be handing the, the uh, mic to uh, our very own, I like her in him, our <laughs> very own bona fide member of the house, uh, Mr. Mustafa. Of course, Mustafa is a very um, enthusiastic person when it comes to current affairs, and this is why we have him on board. But today he's going to tell us um, of our own very website and what has been one of the most trending um, uh, information that we've had on our website. And please do not forget to give them the website to log on to after the show. Uh, thank you very much. Um, what we have reported has not been very much different from what the mainstream media has carried because um, myself, I mean, we all cover mostly the same issues. But we've co focused on some other issues that also have not been captured in the mainstream media. And we've tried to confirm it with uh, in some cases with Gambia government, things like uh, the reported arrest of uh, 30 Gambian migrants in Senegal right. who uh, AFP said were trying to move to Europe and they were arrested by the Senegalese authorities. The Gambia immigration did say though that they they were not aware of this, uh, even though AFP, AFP is the French news agency. And also, the, uh, the, the it's difficult to pronounce the name, but it's it's no uh, Austria's biggest newspaper, but it's also a far-right newspaper, which also reported that uh, 21 Gambians and Nigerians nationals were deported to Nigeria and Gambia, but they wouldn't mean, they, it's not been it's specified not mm -hmm. how much are Gambians and how much are Nigerians. Mm -hmm. It's been reported by their, uh, their local newspapers. We've covered that and... Um, because you know migration is being a quite a hot topic in west right. africa it's one more reason why eu is even trying to uh, have a 
a negotiation with uh, African West African countries called the good practice document quote unquote mm -hmm. which is actually going to tailor out how migrants who do not have papers in Europe should be deported mm -hmm. and how they should be reintegrated into the society and that document is being talked about with Gambia with Nigeria with with all, any, all, all, all the African countries yeah mm -hmm. so um, we've also and that's something that we've not talked about that is also the the mentioning of the the TRRC, uh, the 11 commissioners. Yeah, 11 yeah. commissioners. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, and it's also, it's exciting how people are talking about yeah. this and people are, you know, trying to, uh, some few names have come up uh, as some peop few ones that people are critical of, people don't think, are, you know, should be there and they are conflicted. Uh, uh, people have started talking about it. That's also mm. something we have... Um, we've looked at I, I think that's so far uh, it uh, we, that one is very interesting yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, thank you very much I tell you wherever we have Mustafa he always gives us with latest updates but now to one of the most exciting sessions for me I always like to say it's um, one of the most exciting sessions for me because it deals with the entrepreneur and what we do is we profile a Gambia that is actually doing very well be it a startup business or already established business because it has to do with the creation of employment and those, of course it helps um, the economy of the Gambia so today we're going to be profiling a young Gambian he's 22 years old and a third year student of the University of the Gambia who owns a that poultry farm I know I am all the way um, at Brikama we were very I was lucky to be part of the team that went to um, have an interview with him and he is quite enthusiastic about what he is doing he loves poultry and I'll tell you even his younger ones are also being groomed to take up this responsibility you know over the years we often say that Gambian businesses do not last for more than we haven't had a Gambian business that have um, survived for more than more than hundred years or even um, sixty years because we talk they talk about one of um, the oldest um, businesses. But this time around, let's have a watch of what Modu Lamin Fati has for us. My name is Modula Amin Fati, a 22-year-old Gambian, and I'm the founder and the current farm manager of MS Poultry Farm. And I'm also a student of the University of the Gambia, a third-year student. Yeah, if you look into the poultry statistics of the Gambia, about 95% of our poultry products is imported into this country, which we can produce locally. So I also like there is a gap in the market which need to be filled. And if you look at agriculture in general, youths in the Gambia like don't are not engaged that much into agriculture because people think that agriculture is for the rural people. So me being a youth, being in the urban area, I saw these opportunities. I said, let me get into to the poultry because at the end of the day, I'll be able to create jobs for myself and earn a decent living out of it and create jobs for other people. And, I'll, I didn't, and also I'll be producing food that will contribute towards the full self-sufficiency of the Gambia. Yeah, late in 2017, around November, December, I went to a training, then met up with some poultry farmers. Though like I have the intention of getting into agriculture, but like then like not into poultry. So after meeting with this, poultry farmers like they, they introduced me to the poultry thing then like I saw my interest from there I make the research till around December January from December January I was making a research then I, I raised phone after raising the phone in January 2018 we build up the structure then in February we start the production
when i was having the idea the chal- one of the main challenges was finance because i wanted to have in the uh, total amount of money but i approached my family like my dad in specific so i tell him about the idea then after somewhere like i raised some fund then he helped me to to raise up the fund so fa- access to finance was a bit ch- what a, was a challenge in the beginning but alhamdulillah we are able to overcome it and things are going a bit smooth i don't know so if you have a product like access to market because you check do like i say like 95% of poultry products it's imported but the locally produced poultry products are more expensive than the imported one so if you want to sell your products to an average gambia he will see like man i don't understand from that cost but what do you tell is like ours are grown locally and like the, the quality was and the chickens like you buy them from the farm you slaughter them that very day or like you or you can keep the one day two days but the imported chicken you don't know like how it is processed but that also i list what up with some poultry farmers and also market vendors that do sell live chicken so uh, but the marketing part we have able to overcome it and also one of the things like the knowledge too because i was i was getting into the business i, I do not understand the whole business especially the practical part fully but now alhamdulillah every, every challenge every challenge i have i will call some old some poultry farmers who are my friends or visit their farm and sometimes they come and visit my farm and they will show me like do this do this we are doing this thing wrong do do do, do this thing right do this thing right and now that is really helping me since i start like create a job for myself and two other family members like because this a charity begins at home so i create a job for myself and two of my sisters because i'm not always here as i said to you earlier i'm here and i go to school and also have some other engagements so whilst i am out if the chickens they need water or they need feed my two sisters they will step in because they know how, how to do it whether i am here or not here like they can control the business so in total three including myself the category of people mostly are poultry farmers also you have the market vendors that do sell like live chickens like those um, and, and ordinary people but they are not that much because for me I sell my products in wholesale so I sell it to other poultry farmers and also market vendors so really I do not sell it to so market because normally the price and that may have paid like it, that is a little bit complex so I sell it to the poultry farmers I raise them maybe up to 2 to 3 weeks they come and buy it and the market vendors when they are mature I sell it to them The next step is SCML Poultry Farm as one of the biggest poultry farms in the game if not the biggest. Though like the business is very new like we are in the 6 months of operation this is why like we are taking our time because in business like one thing I learned from people though like my father is a businessman a lot of successful businessmen or one thing I learned from them like you don't rush in business like you have to grow organically like you grow step from step 1 step 2 step 3 step 4 like I can grow from step 1 to step 10 but along the way I will crash so I decided to grow from step and go to step 2 so go to step 3 so in the next five years we will understand all the things into the poultry business then we will grow like we will become one of the leading poultry farms in the Gambia because we already have our plans and we are working towards it Welcome back viewers after that um short video. Um of course we do have a special guest today on our show but before I do that we'll take you through um Vox Pop that we actually spoke to the UDP leader Mr. Osenu Dabo Honorable Osenu Dabo who is the Vice President of the Republic of the Gambia and as well the party leader of um the United Democratic Party and recently they just celebrated their 22nd anniversary so we'll hear from him now Once again, I welcome you all to the brunch. Well, today we are at the residence of the United Democratic Party's leader, Hussein Odabo, and um, he's going to tell us a bit about the UDP. Um, can you please tell us how UDP was formed? 
uh, actually UDP was formed in 1996. Uh, I remember people like uh, Keba Tamba Jame and uh, a lot of other people really got together to form uh, a the party. Uh, at least it didn't, it didn't have a name and uh, put together a constitution for an organization. I didn't have a leader. And uh, uh, I was in the United States then, attending the uh, Olympics, Atlanta Olympics, you know. And, uh, when I came back, I was approached, and I learned that some people were approached to lead the party, uh, but they declined. And um, when I was approached, I did not accept. I mean, after all, I mean, uh, if I knew that if I was getting into any such thing, I wasn't getting into it alone. I was getting into it with family, with friends, and I had to do consultations. And uh, uh, the consultations, uh, all, all those are, are, are consulted, all agreed that, you know, I should I mean, take up the leadership. It was then that we came back, and uh, uh, I looked at the document the constitution and I brought in on it uh, my lawyer uh, maybe my lawyer experience to have it you know crafted in language that uh, uh, looks a little bit you know legalistic and uh, also thought about name yeah and we agreed that uh, it should be United Democratic Party and uh, for symbol uh, the handshake which we think, you know, will really reflect the united character of the party. You know, how much, I mean, peace, handshake is a symbol of peace, symbol of unity. And Mbemba uh, Tambedu suggested uh, the handshake, and uh, we agreed on it. And uh, the motto of the party, I mean, justice, peace, and progress, you know, I threw that out. Because I mean, we couldn't take you know progress, peace, and you know, any of the things. Whether either progress, peace, prosperity, or prosperity, peace, progress would be PPP. You know, we couldn't. We thought that you know uh, that would probably have been an, an anathema to the then regime. You know, was so uh, uh, rejecting of anything PPP. And I thought that you know that justice, peace, and progress that. Uh, uh, the, these three pillars we are very uh, important in any society uh, you won't have peace in any society if there is lack of justice and uh, you won't have progress in any society if there is no peace so we thought that you know we should have p i mean justice peace and progress and uh, i became leader of the party, uh, thanks to the confidence of uh, uh, those who really thought of the idea of putting the, of putting the, the ideas together and uh, deciding that you know, it should be translated into a party. I mean, there are eminent people involved in it, you know, I mean, uh, politicians that we are banned. Uh, parties that we have, I mean, uh, uh, of course, uh, if not banned, but uh, the leaders were not interested anymore. Uh, uh, GPP, you know, under Uncle Hassan Musa Kamara, that was one such party. Uncle Hassan Musa Kamara was one of the uh, supporting pillars, you know, for the formation of the party. And, uh, Azman Nadiba was, his, was our first national president. And uh, we pay tribute to his memory, to his devotion to the cause of the Gambian people at a time when many people were not prepared to come forward to be of service to their country. Just like I was approached, so did we approach some other people to become president, national president of the party, and they politely declined. But Ansman Adiba, and others really took up 
from when they challenge. So did Ajahn Jambandin Rame of for the women's wing. There were women who were not men forthcoming, but Ajahn Jambandin Rame did. And she led a cohort of very dedicated women. Yam Saka, Sajo Kunjansane, Ajaskwainaka, Ajifat Saka, Sakom, Safim Boj, and uh, provided the pillar for the women's wing. And you have young people, young activists like Maimuna Sisi, now in the United States, and Tasamba, who has translated beyond. They were, I mean, uh, the pillars of the young, uh, among the young people that provided support for the party. So, really, uh, we have gone a long way. If we were a natural being, we would have so said that, you know, we have attained adulthood. Because uh, 22 years of existence is certainly the beginning of adulthood. And uh, we have really gone a long way. And I want to congratulate all those people who from the beginning took part in the formation of this great liberating movement of this great party. And those who as recently as last month decided to join the United Democratic Party together with all of them, we are celebrating I mean, the birth of the United Democratic Party, I mean, this August, 23rd August. Yesterday was our 22nd anniversary. <music>
one of the most amazing event I have ever witnessed in my life. And this has been the same trend, the same popularity with Dabo up to today. And I'm not even surprised that he is the vice president of the country. And I have to thank him for that. And I want to congratulate him. You know, and the whole world is listening to me. And I say, Mr. Dabo, big, big congratulations. Thank you very much. Mr. Lamin Chami, have something to say? Yes, I remember that uh, rally in Rikam, September 96. And even the BBC World Service, their headline, Focus on Africa, said, a party, a man, a party with the biggest support. I mean, but I want to ask Mr. Jana because that was the very first time the military junta, yeah, general, they come to realize that a lot of governments disagreed with them on their agenda to stay in power. If there's anything that rally indicated on that day was that message to Jamme that look, the majority or a lot of people don't agree with your plans to stay in power. Now, looking on 22 years back, did it ever, because, because there was a time when it occurred to some people that the UDP may never come to power. Given the fact that one, there was persecution by the APRC and the fact that people did not see a coherent and united uh, party because people, people, people actually jumped the ship. There was a time, in fact, you were even reported rightly or wrongly to have crossed capital to the APRC. Was that correct? Did you think at any given time that you thought that a day like today will come when the UDP will be in government either by themselves or in partnership with others? Well, actually, to give you the shortest answer, that has, that has never crossed my mind. Mm -hmm. I, I was participating... But you had a rumor. This is the first time I'm hearing that. Ah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> this is the first time I'm hearing that. Okay. Because I, I had my hand in everything that affects um, UDP activities. Yes. Both in the diaspora and in the Gambia. Mm -hmm. And I was in the diaspora in the US particularly. I was doing a lot mm -hmm. for my people back home in the Gambia here. You never even think of... I, I would have never thought okay. you know, of doing that. Because I, I, I knew at the time mm -hmm. what I went through and what I am going through. Mm -hmm. Because all that I was interested was to restore democracy back into the, into the, into the Gambia. Mm -hmm. I was sponsoring rallies. I was taking care of women folks. I was sponsoring the youths. I was doing everything for the UDP in my powers. And uh, basically, I had nothing. I had no other job other than to see that the UDP survives. Mr. When, 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 how, I, I've read somewhere that you would go into jail for about seven times. Like you've been arrested seven times. That's true. Where are you tortured in all those instances? And what, what have you done? I severely tortured. If I, if, I, if I show you the, the graphic of the, of the torture, you wouldn't believe your eyes. You know, because at that time, it was so tough you know, to identify yourself as a strong UDP advocate. Just in the case of Dabo. Before Dabo came in, there were so many people that they contacted you know, to be the leader of the UDP. But during those days, I am telling you, Mustafa, it's, it's so tough for somebody to identify yourself as, as a member of the UDP, particularly to challenge you know, those in power at that time. Um, you know, but Dabo, Dabo, Dabo sacrificed a lot. He sacrificed everything in his life. His wealth, his knowledge, his bravery. Whatever you may think about. There were so many people. They were contacted to be the leader of the UDP and they all declined. Because even not for you, but family members would call you in the middle of the night. They would call up a family meeting. Or oh, you want to lose your life? <laughs> you want to challenge this president? You want to kill yourself? You, you want to make yourself you know, an animal? You were, so in detention, you were in detention in 1996, I suppose, for about two months. 
more than more, more than more than two months i'm telling you why we, why were you detained and what happened to you while you were in jail yes we had we had presidential election on uh, 26 september 1996 and uh, four days after the presidential election that was 38 september 1996 i got arrested for that particular day and i got arrested twice i was i was arrested in the morning i was taken to the Brikama police station and i was kept there until 6 p.m i was asked to go home and then after two three hours they came back for me again where are you told why i wasn't told why uh, until after after 30th september october november 5th that was the first day i knew why i had been arrested and, and the reason was I was arrested number one because I was roaming the streets of Brikama during um, voting on the 26th September and that could have that, that, that influenced so many voters you know to cast their vote for, for the UDP number one number two they said I addressed a rally in Gunjur where I insulted the president and accused him of being a drug dealer and, and number three they said, I read a newspaper in one of the rallies in Birkama, you know, I read a newspaper accusing the president. I said, I said, reading a newspaper, is that a crime? They said, I said, was I the author of that newspaper? They said, no. Am I not a Gambian? Don't I have the right to buy a newspaper of my choice and read it? They said, yes. And, and, uh, and the fourth one, they said, they got information that I was meeting the Guinea-Bissau government, you know, to bring back the uh, former president Jawara back to the country. I said, geographically, I, I don't even know where Guinea-Bissau is because I've never been there. And, and, and number two, I wasn't even a minister in the PVP regime. I wasn't a minister. I was simply an administrative secretary responsible for political affairs in the West Coast region. You know, and I... And I basically de uh, deny everything. Sir, uh, Osa, uh, uh, I want to first of all commis uh, commiserate with you for what you have gone through. There was a yeah. famous question, where were you? Um, I, a lot of people were here and doing something, but some of you were more visible than others. And because of that, I want to thank you for all of your efforts uh, in the past and the present. Uh, moving forward, though, there is there has been an accusation against a lot of the political parties we have here, including the UDP, that what they have to present to the voters goes nothing beyond identity and food on your table. And you have been accused, the UDP especially, of being of a Mandinka party. Uh, my question to you, though, is that being the, the biggest party right now, and chances are that you could form a government in the future, what plans do you have for us in tangible, practical terms when it comes to youth empowerment, for example? You have commended the women. How? What plans, what programs do you have to present to the voters? How can you convince me that I should vote for you? Why should I? In the first place, before I come to your answer, I have to clarify something that the UDP is, is a Mandinka party like that. Mm -hmm. That's that's baseless. That's a, that's a false statement. If you look at the composition of the UDP from its inception, you would have rightly recognized that it is not one ethnicity that dominated the UDP. The leader of the party, of course, Usenu, but the deputy leader then was Yaya Jalo, and Yaya Jalo is not a Maninka. He was a, he was a fool, he's a fuller. The administrative secretary of the UDP. Ibu, Ibu, Ibu Mane, Ibrahim Mane, it's, it's not a Mandinka. He's a Wolof from Banjul. Amadou Tal, the treasure. You know, Femi Peters. Momo Lamin Singul Nyasi, may he so rest in perfect peace. It's not a Mandinka. I am second order, I just so kind of. Second or car and others. How would you just justify that the UDP is a Mandinka party? That's, that's wrong, that's absurd. Those are those are statements from our detractors, just to tarnish the image of the UDP. But basically, the UDP belongs to every tribe in this country. But, but what and makes what makes UDP UDP then? What is UDP about? Because we lived as a family and we are still living as a family, as one Gambia, one nation. As far as people. as far as your programs go, 
as far as our programs, we have been advocating for a lot of programs, okay. empowering the youths. In what ways? You know, we we had we had a youth program, which was run by Momon Lamin Simulnyas. He was touring the entire breadth of this country, meeting everywhere, from village, every village to every hamlet. Simul was doing that, and the youth. This was one of the reasons why it was so difficult, you know, to scrap the UDP from the political scene in the Gambia. And you had the women for two. Um, you know, but uh, if you look at if you look at UDP yeah. and you look at the agenda upon which UDP is being established, it's being established by people. They came together and went for a leader. It was not established by a leader and go for people. But if you look at which is in fact a mass based movement which turns into a party like PPP was. But if you've seen the UDP now since it's come into government, you've seen that same party now being taking control by the elites who are now even talking about university degree for a, a presidency. Look, um, let's take for example Jawara Jawara never formed the PPP. Jawara has not formed the PPP. That's what Jawara I'm saying. Yeah, I'm what saying. Yeah. Yeah. I am saying yeah. the UDP has been formed by the people at the grassroots mm -hmm. who came to identify Dabo as a leader. As a leader. But now it's since you've been in the government, there are a lot of people who are coming and you are pushing certain people at the background, the so-called Karambalolo, mm -hmm. and then the so-called Karana, they are taking over. And, and, and no, I, I, you don't I, think that's no, concerning? No, no, no. It's, it's, not, it's not concerning and it's not even something that I want to believe in. Because the UDP is still maintained by the same people. By the same people? The by, first by, by the same people. And there has never been any distinction, there has never been any discrimination as he was a member or he was not a member. I'm not saying that. No, 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 I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming to your answer. You know, I'm coming. Because we, we alone cannot make the UDP what it is today. You have to have people, you have to accommodate people. You have to have good rapport with people. Being APRC, being NRP, being DOI, being that. Once they are interested and they, have, they know the philosophy of the UDP, accept them in good faith. And this is what we are doing. I am saying, when, PP, when PPP, for instance, let me give you a historical example. When PPP was formed, Jawara became the leader. Yeah. There are certain people who felt at some point that Jawara had been absorbed into the elitist group. Mm -hmm. And that somehow he has betrayed the protectorate, the, the grassroots people who took him to power. And this is what Serif Diba relied on to build his own political base. I am saying UDP, in some sense, appears to be following in the same direction. No, no, they it was your spokesperson who said it was your spokesperson who said that the issue of presidency should start with bachelor's degree. That was your spokesperson. He actually said uh, <laughs> high school minimum high school qualification is too low. Too low for too low. president. That was your spokesperson. But, but um, to, to my own knowledge and to my own understanding, UDP has never pushed any, anyone aside. And UDP has never pushed any, um, like say, the Karambalo and anything like now, that. Let, let me UDP uh, has always been UDP. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the main reason why. How many elections did we have? No. How many elections? No, no. Just yes, for example. Take, take that for example. If there are people who are disgruntled in UDP, we would not have won all these three elections. Take, take that. Bear in mind, you are only we would not less have. than two years in government. We have not. Now, we cannot see a you cannot, you cannot, you cannot. We, Mustafa, we, we, Mustafa, we people will disagree. You, people you, will disagree. There are a lot of manifestations that are right under our eyes. There are there are so many things that are happening now, and they were not happening before. You have to give us that credit. Uh, I, I'm going to say quickly. Lami, can you can you give me? Yeah. I'm going to say quickly. People are coming from the diaspora to the Gambia here now. A, a, a typical example is my mother died in my absence. I couldn't I couldn't attend the funeral. I I I I, I hate to give I'm that credit, Mr. Wasa. So that can tell you that how the democracy is flowing and 
how we are progressing. I hate to give that credit to the government or even to the UDP gov uh, yeah. the UDP party. Mm -hmm. The fact that we have this environment is a collaborative work, yeah. both the electorates right. and the people. Mm -hmm. So if there is anything else the government or the UDP party should take credit for, it shouldn't be that environment. Uh, so my question to you is, you mentioned the youth, uh, the women. As far as I understand, uh, what, what the political parties do in this country is to use them to mobilize votes. Right. When that is done, what do they give them in return? So my question is, as you are a waiting government, you are not the government now, but as you are the waiting government, the youth already feel frustrated. The women are feeling frustrated. A lot of people are feeling, we have, there is so much frustration about the economy right now. So when you come into power as the waiting government, what plans do you have to transform these sectors? from where it is now to where we envision? You have to understand that we have been in a dictatorship for almost 22 years. And that's why we need to move and, forward. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and uh, it, is, it is going to be very, very difficult to, to make this judgment within two years. You know, even, even, even somebody who is the president now, even Adama, Adama is just going to do his part. But I don't think Adama can fix all the damages that we had in this country. It is not possible. You know, there had been so many damages. You have to understand that. And, and it, it was right under your eyes. All these damages, you saw them. How is it possible for somebody? Look at the infrastructure development that are going on now, presently, in this country. Look at... No, 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 no. Excuse me. Don't interrupt me. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Look at the progress that people are making in terms of democracy, movement, speech, rule of law, good governance, transparency. Okay. Mm. Mr. Jane, uh, yeah. before you, we come to your section, yeah. we in the branch were discussing the state of UDP as by relations with the coalition partners and in fact, on the other hand, with President Barrow. Did you, as a as, as an established UDP supporter from the very beginning, agree with any suggestion that there is a wage developing between President Barrow and the UDP. I mean, a, a division, a difference of agenda. I, I am not aware, and uh, I don't think there is any. That's the only answer I can give you. I am not aware, and I don't think there is any right is, at this moment. What is your position on many people's speculation that this national <laughs> youth movement, or battle movement for national development, mm -hmm. is a political party in disguise? People have a right to speculate in any form they want. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is that I know is that the UDP is a party and it is solid and we are on a good footing and we are on a good foundation and that the UDP is going to progress. You were a I victim of the past regime and um, uh, when, when the regime change happened there were a lot of talks around the issue of justice for the past victims. Um, isn't it a frustration for even you that it has gone a time and nobody has been so far held accountable for certain things that had happened? I, 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 I know about that, but you have to understand that there has been a commission, the TRC commission, and it is coming, and as soon as it starts work, everything is coming to light. Yeah, but the TRC is not a substitution for judicial justice. But they you will don't want to see people being tried and locked. Yeah, but they will make recommendations. And uh, the Justice Department will follow that recommendations, and the government will follow those recommendations, and they will do appropriate actions. I, I believe that. Yeah. So my final question to you is: We have raised this issue here before, and it, it's, it's going to be very important for you to shed light on it. It's about the three-year term, the three-year term, and uh, versus the five-year term limit that uh, President Barrow uh, is supposed to serve. So what is the UDP's position on this? Because I know a lot of other coalition members would go for three years, but it's apparent that perhaps President Barrow would want to stay for five years. So what, what is your take on that? I, I am not a constitutional lawyer, hmm. and I'm not conversant with 
the constitutional laws of the Gambia. All that I know is it's a verbal agreement. Mm -hmm. Baro can stay for five, ten years if he wants. If he and wins if, 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 the, if he wins, yes. it's left to the if people. He wins election. It's left to the people. Mm -hmm. It's an agreement. Where have you seen the agreement? Where, what, what signature have you seen on that agreement? Can you show me that on the table here? If you are, if you are talking about that. You could have come up with a, a paper showing that, okay, this has been signed, this has been signed, this has been signed. Where is it? Do you have it? Yeah, but it was in the manifesto. It's, 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 it was in the manifesto. I think. Well, it was an agreement on I principle. Think, I, Mr. An agreement, agreement on principle. But Mr. Janet, where that, can you show me? Where Mr. can you, you know, convince you know me? That this show you. Mr. Janet, you know what I can show you? You know what I can show you? Don't you think insisting on the signature, signatory or signatures is just not a way of doing yeah. it? What apparently want to establish it, there indeed was negotiations centered on that. And in fact, in the manifesto of the coalition candidate. And, and you can say that maybe it was a why many people voted too. After the, after the negotiation, after the uh, um, discussion, has anything been signed on mm. that behalf? No. Now listen. So, so, my, so, my point is, does it have to be a verbal agreement? Can't we say, Mr. My, 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 my first question is, I said I am not a constitutional lawyer. You should, you should respect me for that. Yes. Yeah, me do. So if you want to squeeze me, if you want to be tough on me for that, you are going to be very unfair to me. No, actually, what I what we are Dabo, trying to say. Dabo is a constitutional what lawyer. What we are trying to say. Invite him. No, Dabo has made his position clear from the very beginning. Okay. That he thinks, mm -hmm. he said it mm -hmm. on record. And what did he say? He said, in fact, if anybody tries to challenge, mm -hmm. uh, you know, this three year business, versus five years, mm -hmm. he would, he's willing, the UDP is willing to go to court to challenge that. That's what he said initially. Okay. That it should be five years and that's all. But then what we're trying to say here is the position of the UDP had always been that it should be five years. Is this still the case or they're beginning to change their mind? We are not changing any, anything. So you believe they should serve five years for that? Period. We are not changing anything. Mm. Now, what do you make of, uh, at the beginning of the transition, the initial impression we got, a message from the coalition, was they were going to act in unison as a coalition, independent coalition, straight into the parliamentary elections, the local government elections, etc., etc. Four years, four months into them coming to office, um, the parties split and contested elections on party lines, and many people accused the UDP of propagating that idea and therefore breaking up the coalition effectively. Do you agree with that? I think I agree with I don't I don't I don't. I don't. Why do you think the UDP should insist that the party should go on their own? UDP is a party of its own and the UDP felt that it is their own right. UDP felt that they should participate in the local elections in the name of UDP, not in the name of the coalition. In the name of the UDP. And we did it. Now listen. And the result saw that People are in for it. Many people at the time believed that that insistence of the UDP to go <laughs> on party lines broke the coalition. No, no. I don't, I don't, those, those are, those are statements from detractors. Detractors? Yeah, those are statements from detractors. Look at, look at the result of the elections. How many elections did we have here? I told you, how many elections did we have here? Which party dominated? So isn't it then the party, then, party it, dominated? Isn't it then in the interest at the time of the UDP to show mm -hmm. which party has a majority by going on their own, so that they can they, so that they can expose the position of the weaker we, members we, of the we coalition? We have ever been showing that. We have ever been showing that. Yes, you have, always, you have you have always propagated that there should be a party led because Adam you have tested his strength well before he came to the coalition. Adam tested his strength in the name of UDP. You could rightly remember, Adam went on a countrywide tour and the reception was fantastic. Yeah, we could have done it alone at that time. Really? We could have <laughs> at that time. And you would the, have won. The, 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 we would have won. The enthusiasm <laughs> no, of the people. Not many people would agree to that. The, the, the you had done it before, you the, couldn't. The, the enthusiasm, the zeal <laughs> of the people. Okay. You know, wanting change in the country was so magnificent was so apparent, was so clear. Lamin. Thank you very much, Mr. Wasser. Yeah. And thank you for sharing your stories with us. I must say this session that you have been an impeccable one because most of the youngsters out there are able to learn what had
transpired during the 1996 formulation of the United Democratic Party and as well having a first-hand information from one of the victims of the previous government I must say thank you very much for sharing your insightful story thank you so much and now to one of my most um, pleasant sessions of this uh, front show which is um, the hotspot of the week and we will be taking you to what we call utopia and envy it's located at Fajara and this is the spot that I always like to be the um, utopia and uh, envy is managed by a young Gambian her name is Mariama Kasama she has been doing very well for herself and then she organizes what we call karaoke every Thursday let's see what she has for us on yeah, utopia yeah. ground mm, we'll go by. My name is Mariama, um, Mariama Kasama. I am overseeing Envy and Utopia Clubhouse. And it's the best spot in town. It's the hottest. And I believe that's why you're here. So let's get to it. <laughs> The ambiance is unmatchable anywhere else. It's the only club in the Gambia where you can go and have a group of adults having um, safe fun, you know, good music, <laughs> fantastic service, spectacular drinks and stuff. You know, everything here is just exquisite. So we like to believe we're kind of up there. It's a members members club. Well, we we'll we just don't like it. We actually love it. Uh, it's well situated. It has nice food, nice drink. It's lovely. It's it's lively. So usually our members have perks, which include you don't have to pay um, to enter most of the time. Except if we have um, big events where we have maybe an artist from another country come, which costs us a lot. So what we only what we ask for is like a member's contribution, instead of say, oh, members pay if you know. We give, we'll specify a certain sum for to become a member's contribution, and then the people who are non-members will actually pay the gate fees, which is going to be maybe a slightly higher price. But for a space like this, um, usually when we have artists come and play, we want it to be so intimate and so nice. We don't want it to be overcrowded. So we make a slightly higher price. That way we won't have too many people here, especially kids come around. Start, start off from Wednesday. On Mondays and Tuesdays, the club is closed. So downstairs is open uh, um, seven days a week, which is a restaurant. But here we open um, Wednesdays, which is ladies' nights, our nights. And we have Thursday, which is karaoke. That's tonight. That's happening downstairs. Um, Friday, we have salsa. Saturday is like regular club nights. And on Sundays, which, which is um, an event we just started not so long ago, and we call it Soiree Sundays. That's um, the event that we do here every Sunday. And we have Barhama. I know you know Barhama and um, Jalimadi. You know, the, the, those are like the top in Gambian music at this moment right now. So we have them here entertaining you with a live, live band every Sundays. If you want to have an exclusively adult party, very nice, in a very chill environment, as you can see, it's really hot outside, and you have the ACs on here, we don't even feel like it's a, a, a rainy season. So you know what I mean? So that's some of the things. And our service here is completely second to none, like I mentioned earlier. When you come in here, we cater to you from the moment you step downstairs from the security booth. I mean, we even have umbrella services for our clients. Like, you don't have that in any club in Gambia. It's only at Envy and Utopia Clubhouse. We have umbrella services downstairs. In case it's raining, you will, will, uh, we have someone to escort you from there to the ticket office. If you're going to pay, you pay. If you're a member, you just walk up, come. If you have a reservation, we'll show you to your table. We have hostesses as well. Um, we're the only club that have hostesses. So your every need literally is catered to. If you, uh, um, we have hostesses that are in here that will show you to your seat. And if you need something, they'll 
take you to maybe show you the bathroom, show you the bar. You know, just to have, make sure you have a good time. We have someone to cater to everything. We have the waitresses on the floor and the bar. And our staff are very, very well trained. We, 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 um, we pride ourselves of hiring actual professionals who have had some time in the industry, you know. And, you know, they've had the experience. And with all the experience they've learned other places, put it together. That's why this place is so great, because their service is fantastic. Um, we're expecting a big influx when the season opens, so we might have to like put the prices a little higher, but not because we want to cheat anybody, but because for comfort. We want it to be a situation where we have enough number of people, because sometimes we are so full, we ha I have to literally go downstairs and ask the security to like not admit anybody else in, because at that point, we don't want people to just come in and be all sweaty and smudgy and stuff. We want you to come in here and we're trying to sell you an experience, basically, where you will not have it anywhere else in Gambia. When you come in here, uh, um, when it's too full, we stop tickets. We don't get greedy with the money. We stop ticket sales and the people, so that the people in here will have fun. When we have some people go out, then we let others come in to, to level it up. But we never take too many people. The club, um, generally on from Wednesdays all the way through Sunday, the club doors are open at 9 o'clock. The staff are here at 9. 9.30, we have music and the lights, everything on, ready for service. So between 9 and 11, anybody can walk in and lounge because the music is not too loud, for starters, and you can come with your friends, have a chat, you know. We even have playing cards in case you guys want to just come and chill and hang out. Um, aside from that, we uh, at 11 o'clock, that's when the loud music takes over, and it's, it's like a wonder world all the way to 5 a.m. because... Like I said, there's no other place. We show football games, for example, if the, during the World Cup. We were very happy to host Standard Chattered and their whole bank and some customers of theirs. This was a whole, it was a full house. They came in and they watched because we have about six to seven screens um, in the club. And we have downstairs as well. So we, we show the, the football games. We have this uh, device here which when we press on it, um, the way a waiter from any one of our waiters, they would get the vibration on their, the watch they wear on their hands and they would definitely follow you all the way to the, come to you all the way to the table that um, you've, they've been called. As you can see, as soon as I pressed it, use has come to uh, um, answer to the call. That's the watch we have here. Immediately you call upon them, they arrive, you get, like, that's what we love most, you know. You can call a waiter and take like five minutes and all that, and moreover, they're respectful. Everybody's welcome, we have great times here, great parties, so, you know, it's all good, good food. This is Envy and Utopia Clubhouse, you're welcome anytime. And if you haven't been here yet, what are you doing with your life? You're welcome anytime, guys. Thank you. Welcome back to the brunch and of course we still have a special guest Mr. Wasa Janidas here and you know how we often do it when we have a special guest we indeed want our viewers <coughs> other to know who our special guest is so we take you through a very short I like to call it a game of knowing who our special guest is so are you ready for this session? Are you sure you're ready for this? I am, I am I'm more ready. Okay. <laughs> so our first question is this. What three words best describes Mr. Wasa Jani? Three words. He is pleasant. Mm -hmm. He is helpful. And he is sympathetic. Oh, that's nice. The second question read. Are you ready? I'm ready. It doesn't sound convincing. You have to convince me to carry on. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for this? I am, Joy. <laughs> so who are your heroes? Who are your heroes? 
my heroes are number one. Oh yeah, we send it up. I think we could guess that. Adam, Adam, Baro, Momon Lamin Singul Nyasi, and all the people, all the victims of the past week. Interesting. What um what is the most vivid childhood memory you had? I had a friend called Fabula during the our childhood stage, I was with him all throughout. And uh, he's very vocal that and uh, he was with me all throughout up to the present. Okay. So what is the funniest thing that have ever happened to you? The funniest thing that have ever happened to you? I was sitting with my mom and, and I saw a plane flying over our head and my mom said, you are going into this plane and it happened. Oh, uh, special, yes, so That's special. lovely. So what's the best thing that have, um, what, what's, how much do you like food to start with? Very much. You love food? I love food. So much? So much. So what's your best Gambian dish? Benachim <laughs> and Domoda. <laughs> so what's the one thing people would be surprised to know about Mr. Wasa Jani? He is very considerate and no matter how you offend him, he is always up to his senses. Seriously, I think you're very aggressive. <laughs> well, I want to What I can't you do without? Without what? What can't you do without? Generally, you can't do without your I, I, I bahana or I, your lunet. I, I can't sit by myself. I have to have people around me, oh. smiling, chatting, talking good stuff. Ah, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> What three words best best describe your view of the Gambia? What three words best describe your view about the Gambia? We had full fledged democracy. We now have the rule of law and then the press is free. Finally, are you ready for this? I am. Always. <laughs> So where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? As, as, as a good citizen, I'm always anticipating for the better in the future. Thank you very much, Mr. Wasa uh, Jane. I must say it has been quite an interesting session with you, having you in the studio, like I said earlier, have uh, given a lot, a lot of youngsters out there um, an in-depth knowledge about what the United Democratic Party have been up to. And of course, recently they just celebrated their 22nd anniversary um, of the existence of the United Democratic Party. And on behalf of the brunch and Kirfatu, we want to actually extend our condolence on your child's demise. Um, we got the news and it was quite a sudden one. And we hope and pray that God gives you the heart to condone the pain. Of course, losing a child is one big loss. But indeed, we know Mr. Wasa Jani have been a brave man. And we pray that God continues to strengthen you and strengthen your party towards um, your dreams and your subsequent achievements to come. And thank you for coming. Thank you for all the praise. Of course, um, finally, we'll give the... Um, our panelists um, the floor to share their last words with you our beautiful viewers Mr. Lamin Chamo do you have for us? Well I look forward to a brilliant new week um, and of course looking out to the 22nd anniversary of the UDP and see what the party's message would be now that they are the uh, big partners in the coalition government. Yeah. Thank you, and yeah, I would love to also say thank you to Wasa for being here with us, and I would love to say to our viewers to continue to probe what the government does, what they do not do, to keep them accountable, to make sure transparency stands so that we are all involved in our governance together. Mr. Mustafa? It's been an amazing So I, I think I'm looking forward to having clarity in terms of how government communicates to the people, and also some 
understandable explanation from the Justice Ministry about the the granting of the pardon to, to the Norwegian yeah, convicted pedophile. Thank you very much, viewers. We've come to the end of the brunch show. Of course, do keep following our subsequent shows here on Kerfadra. And don't forget to always watch the brunch every Saturday. Thank you. I am Joy Mwama, and I'm not always alone in the studio. We have brilliant panelists. Do join us next week for another exciting edition of the brunch. Have a great weekend. confused about which estate company to approach. My friend had a bad experience with a particular estate agency after completing his payment and could not even get his title deed. This is serious. Good afternoon. How are you? Thank you. My name is Oli. I'm from I'm India Investors. I'm a Thank you. You know, I must say you came at a very right time. Really? I was thinking about houses. Great. What can your company offer me? EJ Investments can offer you a lot. We're unique in the market. Okay. We own our properties mm -hmm. and we ensure that they're developed with modern technologies. They're affordable and they are strategic locations. We don't just sell pieces of land, but we create settlements. What makes your company different from others? We're different from all real estate companies in the Gambia because what we have to offer is affordability, safety, and security. We ensure that you get a legal contract for when you pay your deposit. And within four weeks of paying your final settlement, we make sure you receive your title date. Four weeks? Four weeks. That's interesting. Yes. Now tell me, what real estate service you need? It's absolutely EJ, investment, and real estate agency.